Welcome to the Etsy Conversations podcast, featuring inspiring interviews with Etsy shop owners, hosted by Ijama Elazu. Hi, and welcome to the Etsy Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Ijama, and I thank you for joining me for another episode. This week, my guest is Liz McDade, and she runs the Etsy shop, No Trace Shop. And um, I'm excited to talk to her because we're going to be talking about not just what she's doing on Etsy, but why. And her reasons for why she started her Etsy shop are kind of different from most other people. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to talk about that. Liz, thank you so much for being my guest and welcome to the podcast. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of the show. Yes, my pleasure. Now, before we jump into it, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, how you ended up on Etsy? Yeah, so um, I uh, have a shop called No Trace Shop, and um, I I started it because I have this um, broader interest in thinking about how we care for the planet and trying to tread lightly on this earth. And so I started thinking about what we're doing in our own, in my own family's life and ways that we could um, live a bit more carefully and more thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking into trying to live a more um, zero waste life, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Yeah. And part of that, um, reaching for that, it's really helpful to have some some sort of tools in your home to sort of reduce the waste that you produce as a family or as an individual. And so um, I started thinking about, well, what are the kinds of things that we could use in our own families to cut down on our own waste? Um, and, and I've always had a love of sewing and crafting and making things. And so um, when I started to change the way we do things as a family, I also realized, well, this could be a really fun business because I love making things. Um, I love thinking about um, what we can do as individuals to to have a more positive impact on the world. And so I could combine those two things and um, try to make some some fun and beautiful products to help other people reach those similar goals. So um, so that was about a year and a half ago, or, or I guess almost two years ago, that I decided, okay, I want to make this I want to make this a business, and um, and I and so I decided that I should have a shop on Etsy uh, in addition to my website. So yeah, that's sort of the long story of how I ended up on Etsy. Yeah, and for anyone who wants to check out Liz's website, it's notraceshop.com, and I will link to it in the show notes for this episode. So Liz, one of the things that I find interesting is um, having lived in California um, and then moving away, I've learned that the there's there are different mindsets when it comes to to environmental consciousness. And I think I think most people would agree that California is like right way up there when it comes to. Um, mm -hmm. being environmentally conscious and doing things to help um, just keep the planet greener and whatnot. And for the longest time, I, I always felt like I was the odd person out mm -hmm. because when California was moving to um, no plastic and, and what have you, I was very resistant, like, you know, why? Um, yeah. Now I get it. And it it became a way of life because you, you had to get on board. But then the more I thought about why they were doing that, the more it made sense. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things, have you noticed any patterns in your sales um, of products that would, would give you an idea of at least in the U S what parts of the country are more environmentally conscious? And I would assume those are people who would buy certain products like the reusable um, bags and stuff for groceries. Mm -hmm. Have you seen mm -hmm. trends like that? Well, I, I think you're right that California is definitely, um, you know, a bit of a leader in that sense in terms of thinking about, um, 
the environment and an and acting policy as well as a state. And then at the county level, I think that we really are at the forefront of a lot of that. And, and I sell a lot of my products um, to people in California, so across the state. But then I also know that people care about these issues all over the U.S. And I have yeah. people who order from me from, you know, the South and the Midwest and uh, the East Coast and Texas. And so I have, um, I think that that people care about this issue, you know, in many parts of the U.S. So I think the only trend really is, you know, I'm here in California and so I have more sales here mm -hmm. um, online. I also sell in person um, at, far at the farmer's markets yeah. and at yeah. some uh, festivals too. So I see a lot more people obviously from where I am, but I know that yeah, it's, um, it's an issue, you know, across the U.S. for sure. Okay. That's good to know that it's it's um, picking up or catching fire or, you know, spreading around around the country and hopefully the world. So yes. one of the things you mentioned was your zero waste. What does zero waste mean? Yeah, it's a really good question. So zero waste is really simply it's this idea of not sending anything to the landfill mm -hmm. um but it the bigger picture of zero waste is really trying to value all of the resources that we use in our daily life mm -hmm. and sort of keep them in circulation and and keep them um in a cycle of use and reuse and um recycling and, you know, recreation. So the, the bigger picture idea of zero waste is to truly value how we make things and to design the things that we make and use in a way so that um, they stay in this sort of cycle of um, being, you know, useful part of our daily life or our society or whatever. And that applies to everything from you know, the food that we eat, so growing it in a sustainable way and not wasting it and sending it to the landfill, all the way to like the carpets in your homes, what kinds of materials are in those and how can you, um, you know, recycle those so that they don't end up in the landfill as well. So it's, um, yes, you can think of it on a very simple level. Some people, um, some of the most sort of famous, so to speak, zero waste people, they have this very visual image of all of their year's trash that would have to go to a landfill fitting in a small jar. So that's like, on, the, you know, on the individual level, zero waste is about creating very little waste. Yeah. But on a, on a bigger picture scale, it's about how we treat things um, all around us and try, trying to really value and keep those things um, oh. sort of, you know, in use and, and out of and not being wasted. Yeah. I hadn't even thought about when you mentioned carpet, carpets, I thought, yes, there's so many, some things just naturally will, will occur to us like, you know, plastic bottles and things that come packaged in plastic. Those are easy to think of, but, but when you talk about things like carpeting, it got my mind wondering like, what else, what other things are not, you know, quite as easy to, or, or don't, don't um, naturally occur to think of as being wasteful or, you know, eventually one day ending up in, in land, in a landfill that we could now start to work on um, uh, replacing with something more environmentally friendly. Yeah. I mean, I think it really applies to everything. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting in my home right now, so I'm thinking, you know, uh, about paint. Um, you, you know, even the paint on your walls, you can get like biodegradable options, um, of furniture, the way furniture is built. Um, you know, you want to buy the ideas that you, you ideally we buy things that are quality and that we can repair. Um, so they're not things that are like throw away. Like once it has a crack, there's nothing you can do to it. They're things that, you know, ha are built in a way that they, they can be repaired. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, really, it can apply to everything. 
Um, and it's and, and and it's an idea that should go into so many pieces. So not only should we design and build things in a better way, but then we need to have this sort of infrastructure in place so that we can repair those things and then eventually so that we can recycle those things mm -hmm. and get them back into the economy, so to speak. So mm -hmm. there's um, so there has to be support for this at every phase, mm -hmm. you know, not just what we buy and do as an individual, but what our communities do to help us with repairing and recycling and um, things like that. So, yeah, I mean, it's really yeah, it's. Um, it's a very lofty goal and it applies to so many things. So, um, and it, and it can feel overwhelming. So I, I like to remind people like, well, just, you know, think about one, one step at a time as an individual, it can be very simple. Like as an individual, maybe you want to start carrying a coffee cup with you, a reusable coffee cup with you and just cut out that one piece of waste. And I think that, um, you know, taking those small steps, makes it easier to take more and more steps. But I always encourage people just to start some, with something small and something manageable that they feel like they could um, actually do and be successful in. And that'll really help, um, you know, increase the, um, the confidence that you have as a person to go out there and, and shrink your own waste footprint, so to speak. Yeah. And you just reminded me of something. I feel like I've relapsed. I will, I'll, admit <laughs> so, um when I when I was in California I, I moved just like a year or so ago and I was so used to carrying my own grocery my own bags to the grocery store because there is no plastic if you didn't bring mm -hmm. your bags you either ended up carrying them out in your hands or in the cart yeah. or <laughs> and so right. eventually you learn to carry your bag with you to the store and it became so normal for me. And then I moved to um, Denver, Colorado, and and I started to feel like the odd one out because I had my own bags at the regular grocery mm -hmm. stores. And yeah. eventually I was like, oh, you know, the bags are here. Why do I, I mean, I still mm -hmm. have my bags in my car, but now it, it's not so natural because everyone else isn't doing it. And I'll, I'll tell you, the only place I remember to do it is when I go to Trader Joe's mm -hmm. because for some reason, Trader Joe's triggers California in my mind. <laughs> and the first thing I do once I park is I grab my my um, grocery store bag and walk in there. And, and there I see other people with with their bags. So I don't know if it's a Trader Joe's thing or mm -hmm. what, but um, I need to not stay in my relapsed mode of using plastic <laughs> bags. <laughs> You can do it. You can do it. Yeah. yeah. Carrying, having your own bags is, um, another great sort of, uh, you know, single step to take Yeah, for sure. Now, one of the things I know about the products that you make is that you design them so that they can be reused multiple times. And, um, one of the questions that occurred to me was, do you have a concern that you won't get much repeat business because your products are reusable. And so so folks, once they buy something, might not have a need to come back and buy another. I mean, except yeah. if they're gifting them. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's some, And it's something that I thought about too. But what, what usually ends up happening, I have a lot of repeat customers. And what usually ends up happening is that they buy one thing. So I make a beeswax wrap, which is, um, that's one of my different products. It's an all natural cling wrap. So it, it's a, instead of saran wrap, it's an organic cotton fabric infused with beeswax. And it serves the same purpose of covering your bowls or wrapping your sandwich or mm. wrapping your casserole dish. Um, so what ends up happening is that people will come and they'll say, oh, you know, I, I heard of this. Maybe I saw a video on on Facebook or on Instagram, mm -hmm. not one of my videos, not one of my commercials, but they have <laughs> seen some commercial that's, you know, some well-produced commercial and they'll come to me and they'll try it out and then they like it. And so they come back and they get more mm -hmm. and then they come back and they get it as gifts. Okay. Um, so, yeah, what I find is that um, most people 
who see me like I met the like I mentioned I met the farmers markets mm-hmm. in Santa Cruz and so who see me at the farmers markets they'll often come back for more okay. um, okay. because they find that it's useful and um, yeah so people usually they want to end up with you know a few different beeswax wraps and a few different veggie bags and you know tote bags and all the things that I make they they often come back for more oh, so okay. yeah. So- I know when I was when I was um, looking at, at your products and 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 considering the the mission that you have behind your store, I thought, oh well, well, what about repeat sales? You know, everybody mm-hmm. wants those, but yes, now it makes sense, and, mm-hmm. and it's a nice way when when given as gifts to spread the message and you know maybe get other people on board with yeah, doing absolutely. their part. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of people like to give my, th- my pieces as a gift to somebody else who, um, you know, ha- is sort of eco-minded or, um, who they think, you know, might, uh, be willing to try something new, um, mm-hmm. in their own, you know, kitchen or daily life. Yeah. So yeah, it makes it a really nice gift and the holidays are usually really busy for me. So oh, good. yeah. Now, how did you decide um, Etsy was going to be your main online sales platform? Yeah, that's a really good question. So when I first started No Trace, I, I started it as a website and, um, and it was like crickets, right? Because I was brand new. I didn't have any kind of, you know, online yeah. presence or authority. And so I wasn't getting traffic. And I, and I actually set up a very simple um, shopping cart feature on my website and I wasn't really getting many uh, people coming to my site. And so I realized, um, if I get on the Etsy, I'll, I'll have a lot more traffic, a lot more people who can easily find me, mm-hmm. um, as part of, you know, as being part of that Etsy community. And so after a couple of months of just being, of just having a website, I set up an Etsy shop. Okay. And then, um, and then that's when I started to get online sales for sure. Okay. Now, yeah. as far as your, your own website, do you try to funnel traffic from Etsy to that site or do you still try to do some independent traffic generation to your, um, shop on notaryshop.com? Yeah, so it's interesting. I I end up doing both things, and and this is why. So I first, like I said, I had set up a shopping cart system on my website, Mm -hmm. and then I had my Etsy shop. And so keeping track of those two different inventories was Mm -hmm. challenging. Yeah. And so what I've done is I've now integrated my Etsy shop into my website. So there's a really simple Etsy um, plugin that works. I have a WordPress um, website. Okay. So there's a simple plugin so that, um, when people go to, to the shop section of my website, mm-hmm. they, um, and they click on a listing, then they end up in my Etsy shop to, to finalize that purchase. And that just makes things, cause I, I'm doing everything myself at this point. Yeah. So that makes things a lot easier for me. So I'm not having to keep track of two separate inventories and, oh, you know, mm-hmm. make sure that they're up to date. So, um, so I do that, but when people come to my Etsy shop and when they make a purchase, they also get in their thank you email, they get uh, encouraged to come back to my site and to join my email list um, so that they can get coupons and, you know, be signed up for giveaways. Mm-hmm. And um, and I do, um, I, blo- I have a blog on my website, and so I, I like to get the... Um, my blog out to people on my email list too. And so I encourage them to come on over so they can also kind of learn and hear about, um, different, different tips and tricks for, for reaching towards a zero waste life. So yeah, so I do both. I have people from Etsy, encourage them to come to my website and people from my website, they make their sale through the Etsy. Etsy. Yeah. That because that takes away some of that, the, the technical knowledge and Mm -hmm. that would go into having a separate shopping cart. Do you remember, or can you recall the name of the app that you use to redirect your sales checkout to go to Etsy, just for anyone who might want to do something similar? 
I wish I remembered the name, but um, I don't offhand, but I'm pretty sure if you do a simple search for a, a WordPress plugin to integrate Etsy, I think there'll only be one or two okay. um, that actually come up. So it should be pretty straightforward, which one has like a good number of reviews and um, okay. yeah, but I don't remember the exact name. Okay, so I will, um, when, when we finish our conversation, I'll do some research. And so I will, when I find it, I'll put the link in the show notes for this episode. So anyone who wants to try it out, um, again, it's a WordPress plugin, which means you would need to, your website would need to be running on WordPress uh, in order for it to work. And so mm -hmm. I'll put the plugin in for for that. I think that's a very neat feature because I know some people, you know, if you're not very tech savvy, you can get bogged down for days just trying to figure yeah. out the shopping cart thing. Right. And you know, the way Etsy um, listings, the, the interface on Etsy for making a new listing and just being able to copy a listing, mm -hmm. it's so easy compared to what I had put up on my website, which was like just... Yeah, so so I really appreciate that about Etsy that they make it really easy to get your listings up. Yeah, just dragging pictures over. Now, did you ever consider? Well, probably not, since you started your website before you you opened your Etsy, your Etsy shop. I was going to say, did you ever consider using just a pattern by Etsy web website as opposed to a WordPress? But yeah, I, I no, I didn't. Yeah, because I, I want, so my goal is for, for No Trace to really grow as a brand. And so okay. I really want, I really want it to have its own separate web presence. Okay. Yeah. And so in addition to um, having the shop, one of the things that you, you do, um, it looks like very diligently is blogging. Do you have a, a, content calendar or a schedule that you follow to make sure you're constantly adding fresh content to the website and where do you get ideas for what you want to talk about? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't use any um, content calendar. Um, I do use Trello, which is a free um, sort of project management tool it's a free online project management tool you can also have it as an app on your phone okay and i use that to track what you know whether or not i'm getting a blog up um regularly Ooh. i'd like to be so right now i'm putting a blog up about once a month but my goal is really to be doing that uh, almost every week okay. um and in terms of ideas and running running out of ideas i you know i've i I haven't gotten anywhere close to running out of ideas yet, just because, um, you know, the, the, what I'm doing in, in terms of trying to live a zero waste life, it applies to so many, um, parts of my, of my life and my family. Mm -hmm. So I feel like there's always new challenges and new learnings to share. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, and that's really what the blog is about. It's about trying to um, live a more zero waste life. And I, and I almost always talk about also like how some of the things that I make can help. So I'll, you know, mention like, you know, if you want this to help you with this issue, you can buy it from me. But I also encourage people like, you know, you could make it yourself or you could go to the thrift mm -hmm. store if you, yeah. you know, you can't afford to buy things from me. I, I want it to be um, useful for anybody. Yeah. But um yeah, I really haven't gotten to that point of running out of ideas because I keep a, like a long running list. And every time something comes to me, I just add it to this. It's a Google Doc, basically a long list of different blog ideas. So, um, yes, I, I'm nowhere near reaching the end of that, <laughs> which is good. Yeah, that is good. Yeah. Liz, what does running an eco-friendly business mean and what does it entail? And in what ways do you think it's different from running a business that isn't as focused on, on environmental friendliness? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, being eco-friendly um, for me means that I'm thinking about the 
um, sort of the life cycle or what's going to happen with the products that I make from the very beginning of the making the products to the very end of the products, you know, life when it's all worn out and used Mm -hmm. up. Um, And so I think about what in the design of the product, what's the most sustainable um, types of materials to use, what kinds of materials can I use that are all natural, that are going to biodegrade or even um, compost in a person's home compost if they have one of those. Mm -hmm. And how can I design things in a way where there's not, where there's very little waste that is created in the design process. Um, And then um, I also think about how I package and ship my products. So I use, I don't use any plastic in any packaging or any shipping of my products. Um, Everything is shipped in paper and, um, and that's one simple step that I think a lot of other Etsy shop owners could could consider mm-hmm. um, if they want to um, try to be a more eco-friendly business is to think about the packaging that you use and is there any way you could cut down on the packaging, the amount that you use, and also any plastic involved. Um, but then the other piece of it for for my for for no trace is thinking about all of the um, waste that does get created, so the little scraps of thread or um, scraps of fabric. So all of that gets saved and repurposed and reused into other things. So I don't send anything to the landfill as a result of, um, you know, making my product. So for me being eco-friendly, it's about all of those pieces, how I design and create things, how I ship things, um, what's going to happen to those things when they're all used up. And then what in the creation process, how can I make sure that all of the um, bits and pieces are repurposed and into something functional. Okay. How much effort would you say it takes or it might take to investigate suppliers that, um, that you work with to make sure they also are, or that the products that they're using are eco-friendly as well. So, um, or, or at least are made with, um, without generating too much waste. So like yeah. your shipping supplies, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a really good question. So um, the so the main fabrics that I use are GOTS certified organic cotton. So, um, so that has its own certification process that you, you know, can trust that they is, is a rigorous process to get that certification. Okay. Um, and then I also use recycled cotton that I get from um, thrift stores or like um, thrift barns, you know, sort of mm-hmm. the, like before it makes it to the thrift store. So I use so the fabric um, that wasn't too hard for me to find. Um, I think if other, you know, Etsy shop owners are interested in using organic cotton, it's it's not that it's pretty easy to find. Um, and there's other, you know, linen is another good sustainable fiber to use. Um, and then of course, recycled fabrics as well. And there, there are a couple of, uh, fabric recycling, um, groups out there as well that I I haven't used yet. They've just sort of recently started selling online, but there's one called Fab Scrap. Mm -hmm. It's based out of New York where you can get, um, fabric that is waste from, you know, New York fashion manufacturing. So they Mm -hmm. capture that waste and then they sell it. Um, so you're keeping that fabric out of the landfill. Um, yeah. And then in terms of my packaging, so I, I look for, so obviously paper, and then I also try to find recycled paper. Um, so all of my, um, tags are printed on recycled paper and all of my envelopes are paper. I don't have recycled paper envelopes. I haven't found those yet, but I would like to. Um, be using recycled paper envelopes. Um, And then whenever I wrap things with, you know, sort of packaging paper to keep them in place in a box or something like that, um, I also use recycled paper for that. Um, So that, yeah, so it hasn't been that much of a challenge. Um, But yeah, it does require some effort. You know, I've reached out to companies and said, please ship me this without plastic. So, So I take that extra step to make sure that I'm not creating more plastic um, as a result. 
of um, of what I'm doing, but it, it's definitely doable. Okay. Would you say, or have you found that going the extra step to to do things in a more environmentally conscious way um, has cost you more, which you've had to, uh, um, which resulted in you having to price your products higher because of that or or it has not um, had that much of a financial effect so that your your products can still be reasonably priced does that make sense the way I yeah. ask the question okay yeah definitely yeah I mean I think my products are still definitely reasonably priced um but uh but yeah using organic cotton fabric definitely increases the price okay. so yeah. um so yeah absolutely compared to like a non-organic um mine's going to be more expensive yeah. but uh but then it's organic and a lot of um you know parents and families and even individuals they really care about that they don't want yeah. you know they want that that certification they want to know that okay this isn't you know, emitting some yucky chemicals into my home. And um, yeah, so that really uh, matters to people. So it's worth it in the end. And it doesn't, I don't think my products are like, you know, majorly more expensive than others. Yeah, no, I'm looking at your prices and, and they look very reasonable, which was why I was asking, because um, I think normally we would think that it would cost more to to um make products that were environmentally more friendly because it there's a, a bit more effort involved in sourcing them and using companies that also are eco-friendly but but um based on your prices they're still very reasonable which must mean that um more companies are leaning that way I feel like if more people are doing it then the prices become more affordable mm -hmm. yeah absolutely okay. absolutely so Liz what does a typical day in the life of no trace shop look like how do you balance everything you're a one woman operation so mm -hmm. you're everything your customer service you're the shipping department yes. you're the manufacturing <laughs> how does a day look like for you Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's days are really busy. Um, so I, you know, every day I'm working on an order, um, at least a couple of, usually I'm working on at least a couple of orders, um, every day. And then I also try to set aside time, um, every day or at least every week where I'm also thinking about, um, the business more broadly. So thinking about, you know, what I should be doing, to be kind of growing as a business. Mm. Um, so that might be like working on a new blog post. Um, I'm also on Instagram. So I'm trying to post on Instagram every day. And um, I'm also on Pinterest. So I, I will post on Pinterest every, I try to post there like twice a week. I'm on a number of group boards. And so I try to promote my blogs, my blog posts on Pinterest as okay. well. Um, and then, yeah, if I have extra time, I like to try out new designs. So I, I love sort of testing new, um, testing new products and, um, and I'm also moving into digital patterns. So zero waste sewing oh, patterns. Yeah. So, um, so then I'll also, I'm also working on those, um, every week as well. Yeah. But the orders, keeping up with the orders always takes priority because I don't want anybody waiting for their order. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's always priority one. And then I, I make time for, um, the other pieces during the day. Yeah. Do you, do you make everything, um, to order? So, when someone orders something, you, you build in time for actually making it, or do you keep an inventory of items so that you can immediately ship? Yeah. So it's both. I have an inventory of items. Um, but then some things I might've sold, you know, at a farmer's market or, or sold to somebody else. And oh, so I'll have no. to make, make another one. So, um, I had a lot of orders, 
So yeah, it's probably a mix. Maybe half of my orders are already made and I can just ship and the other half um, I've already sold and I have to make more of. Okay. So yeah, so half of them are probably made to order, but I still try to ship everything within a couple of days. Okay. So yeah. One of the things that you've mentioned a couple of times now, and I, I, I want to just go into that a bit more, is selling at farmer's markets seems to be um, a significant part of, of how you get your sales and what you do. Mm-hmm. How much effort um, does it take for you to, because I know most farmer's markets are every week, at least once a week in some cities, mm-hmm. sometimes more yes. than once a week. So how does um, the your farmer's market strategy fit into the rest of what you're doing and, and life in general? Because that could possibly be an every weekend type of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it could be crazy. So luckily it's not. Um, I I do about three farmer's markets a month. Oh, So yeah, so not every single week. Um, And um, yeah, it's, I I really love doing that because it gives me a chance to test what I'm making with real people, you know, Mm -hmm. so I can talk to them about it. Um, You know, like I said, I have a lot of repeat customers and I'll talk to them about how things are working for them and what they're using their products for, what they like about it, if there's anything they don't like about it. Um, So it's a really great opportunity to actually be talking to real life customers Mm -hmm. about their needs and, and what they like you know, what they like and what they are looking for. Um, yeah, but it is a big chunk, you know, when you do a market, it's a big chunk of the day. So, um, if there's ever, you know, if there's ever downtime at the market, if it's, if it's slow for some reason, I try to have something else to work on, um, while I'm sitting there so that I don't feel like I'm wasting any time, but usually they're pretty busy and I'm, I'm talking with people and selling things. So um, it's worth my time for sure. Okay, good. Now, I assume at most farmers markets, there's probably some type of fee associated with having a space there. Have you Mm -hmm. found that the cost of doing the farmers markets makes up for, I mean, no, wait, the, the, income that you get from doing the farmer's markets makes up for the costs and um if so uh, okay well, let's deal with that one first <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's a really good question it definitely like that's really important consideration if you're going to be at a market yeah. um for me um it does. Um, there was a market that I did last summer that was just a much smaller market, just a lot fewer people. And so there weren't as many sales. Mm. Um, and I didn't lose any money, but it wasn't worth the time and effort involved. Yes. So I, so I let the, them know I, I just can't do this market. It's just too tiny um, for, you know, for me to make enough sales to make it worth the time involved. Um, but the other, the markets that I do actively do now, um, are worth my time. So they definitely, yeah, there is that fee and they definitely cover the fee and then, Mm -hmm. and then more. So, yeah. So for someone listening now who might want to do a farmer's market, what advice would you give them to go about, um, when it comes to selecting what markets to, to sell in and and how often keeping in mind for anyone listening farmers markets have a different vibe than craft shows or vendor shows yeah it's really interesting so um I've been to farmers markets like I was at a market in Seattle I was visiting um friends in Seattle and I went to their farmers market and there were there was an amazing craft section there was Mm -hmm. like fine jewelry and um, all kinds of just, you know, pottery and, and all kinds of wonderful artisans were there. And then other markets like the ones that I go to are really, really limited. They only want makers who have some food related products mm. um, or soap. So we, we have a soap vendor 
at every market. And then there's me and there's uh, maybe one or two other uh, makers who, who rotate in the, in the rotation with me. Um, but I would say for people who are interested, you know, check out the farmer's markets and see what's happening there. Um, see how you might fit in and then make your case. Um, reach out to the organizers. Usually a farmer's market will have a table um, for the farmer's market staff and, um, and you can just go up to the table and ask them who you would talk to about being a vendor. Um, but yeah, and then you want to you want to make your case like why you would be a good fit for that market, what you have to offer that, and how it would fit in with what they're doing there. So Santa Cruz is very interested in sustainability. Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah, I'm in Santa Cruz, obviously, um, and they're very interested in sustainability and eco-friendly living. And so my products fit really well yeah. with um, with what their you know one of their goals is. So they have like compost set up and recycling and um, yeah. So, um, but yeah, I would say go for it. It's, okay. uh, it's been really a really great experience for me and I've met other business owners through it. And like I said, I've, I've got repeat customers and then I've, I have two wholesale accounts that I got as a result of being at the market. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So, um, so that's really cool too. So yeah. And I always feel that way. Like even if I have a day, and this is true for farmer's market, but any craft event, if I have a day that's slower than I would have hoped, mm -hmm. there's almost always at least one or two connections that I made yeah. with somebody who, um, you know, maybe it could lead to something down the road or they, you know, it's a good fit for what I'm doing. We could find some way to collaborate on something or, you know, who knows? So I try to think about, well, um, not only am I selling things, but I'm also trying to be out in the community and um, connect to other like-minded businesses and organizations. Yeah. Now, when you got the wholesale accounts, were you prepared for wholesale or did you, um, did you jump right into it and then figure things out as you went along? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I had already been doing wholesale. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I was ready. Um, yeah, for sure. But yeah, it's a whole different way to sell. Yeah. Um, so, so I took, I had already put a lot of thought into what could I sell for at wholesale? Um, and, um, what can I not afford to sell at wholesale? Um, so yeah, I had already sort of figured out my pricing in that regard and I try to sell as much as I can wholesale, but there are some things that I make, it just, it's not worth it to sell wholesale yeah. because yeah. of the, the time involved, um, or the materials involved. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that because, um, I think that's something that we sometimes, overlook or fail to take into consideration that not everything is worthy or, or worth the time and effort of being sold at wholesale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, Liz, how, what is your strategy if you have any in particular I know sometimes we don't we just do it um, when it comes to social media I know you mentioned you're on Instagram and you're on Pinterest and you try and pin daily to to boards for your blog um, do you do any pinning specifically to drive traffic to your Etsy shop and on Instagram you, you said you post daily are those posts more for your Etsy shop or for, for your blog and your website? What's, what are your priorities? Yeah, it's a good question because social media, there's so many things you could be doing. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I have multiple personalities on social oh. media and sometimes I'm like, I don't know who I should be today. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. It's hard. It's really hard. So my, my approach that I've taken is to just try to do one thing mm. uh, regularly. So Instagram is the one um, outlet that I try to be on regularly. And okay, that okay. Um, I try, that traffic I generally, and um, it's always going to my website, either to the shop page, mm. which, you know, if somebody 
clicks a listing will eventually take them to Etsy to, to close the sale. Okay. So either yeah. either drives them to my shop page or my blog page, depending on what I'm what my post is for the day. Okay. Um, so that's what I try to do regularly. Pinterest I do I try to do every week. And that um, I have set I have created pins of my products. So those I pin that and those link right to the shop my on, on my website um so i have a page <clears throat> i have a page on my website that's that for each of the products that i make so you know my lunch mm-hmm. bags my beeswax wraps yeah. my veggie yeah. bags so a pin of my of a beeswax wrap will drive traffic to the beeswax wrap page of my website oh. my, and then my blog post pins will drive people to my blog and um, the blog post pins are the ones that I um, have on group boards. Um, and then the product pins I have just on my own boards. Um, yeah. And the idea is, you know, I'm trying to get people on my website and um, share with them all the content that I have, and then also invite them to join my email list. Um, so, you know, obviously you don't have to join the email list to be on the blog, but, um, that's another nice way to stay connected, to learn about, you know, what, what's happening and what kinds of tips and resources are out there for people who are interested in zero waste and people who are interested in these kinds of products. How, how often, um, are you communicating with people on your email list? I try to email once or twice a month. So I'm not super often. Um, Yeah, it would be nice to to email folks weekly, but uh, that's kind of where I'm at right now. (laughs) (laughs) um, Which um, email service provider do you use and are you happy with it? Right now I'm using MailChimp because I don't have a huge email list okay. um, and it is working fine for me. Okay. Um, just the, it's just, fr- it's free and yeah. um, the interface is pretty simple for, for creating a quick email. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I will put a link to MailChimp um, in the notes for this episode for anyone who wants to check them out. One of the things I do like about MailChimp is that you can start for free Um um, up to a certain number of subscribers and so it gives you a chance to learn well one the interface but also get a flow of what you want to be communicating to the people on your mailing list and and how often without having to pay for it for it so that's one of the reasons I liked um, MailChimp. Mm-hmm. Now, when you get an idea for a new product, typically, how long does it take you from um, inception to actually creating it and then having it ready for sale, either on Etsy or in a farmer's market? Yeah, it's another good question. It really depends on my time. So I, you know, sometimes I can get something like start drawing something and then create it like within that week. Mm. Um, And then usually I have to test it out a few times. Um, And so it might be ready to sell to sell in, you know, a week or two. Mm. Um, And then other things I have um, still percolating and they've been sitting on my idea list for a while. So, um, it really just depends, but I would say like one or two weeks is probably the fastest I could go from idea to actually having a product, uh, for sale. How long do you hold on to a product? And by hold on to, I mean, like how long will you have a product available for sale, um, in your Etsy shop before you decide, that um, it's not moving fast enough or well enough to continue that particular line? Yeah, I've, um, I've probably waited. I've probably given some products about a year. Okay. And then just decided, okay, this is, I'm not going to do this anymore. It's not worth any more energy. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious because, um, you know, I guess everyone has a different way of determining 
when when to call it when to call it with with your mm-hmm. products or if you know um or if you follow if uh, some of us some people i should say follow the philosophy of eventually the right buyer will come along and um so yeah just wanted to know yeah and i can also get a sense for products when i'm at the market too so i can mm-hmm. see you know at the farmers market what or at craft fairs and you know festivals what's selling and what's just sitting there and um so i use that also so if i'm seeing that you know if something's selling really well at the farmers market and less well online, I'll still keep it because I do get people who come back for, they want to, you know, they meet me in person and they want to get more things online. So I will keep those okay. listings. Um, but then if I have a product that's not really selling well in person or online, then yeah, I think the longest I've waited is like, you know, a year or so. Okay. What is something about selling on Etsy that you really like and on the flip side are there any features that don't currently exist on the platform that you would like to see implemented yeah um i really like the uh i just i feel like i just recently discovered that you can copy a listing oh yes (laughs) liz that's been around for a while i know (laughs) I know. And I just figured it out. And that saved me so much time. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Um, yes. So that's great. Um, and I also like the um, I have the Etsy app on my phone so that I can reply to conversations quickly if I'm not, you know, in front of a computer yeah. or near a computer at the time. Um, in terms of something else for them to offer. um that's a good question. I I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but I I'm sure that there are lots of <laughs> there's, there's probably a lot of features that um yeah I just can't think of right now. Yeah. Well, that's that's a good sign because it tells me that everything is working well for you, and you know I'm sure that makes you know folks at Etsy happy when people are like, oh, you know, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Now, I know you know about the changes that happened on Etsy not too long ago. What were your thoughts when all that was going on with the transaction fee increase and then the paid plans? What mm-hmm. what thoughts occurred to you and, and how did you respond to um, and and not based on what anyone else in the Etsy community was saying or or doing, but when you found out, how did you process all that? Yeah, initially I was I was a little nervous. You know, change can be scary. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was my first thought was was that okay, I'm gonna have to start paying so that I can get so that I can continue to be found. Sure. Like that was my initial. Uh, reaction was that mm-hmm. okay this is gonna um, impact my ability to get found in the you know people search um, which now I know is not true at least yes. that's what that's what they've said it's not yes. true <laughs> um, but yeah I, I also feel like my business isn't at the level where I need those extra features so you know I, I'm selling um, uh two or three or so orders, maybe four orders a week on Etsy. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't need some of those features I think would be great if I, you know, if I was selling a lot more per week. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of my, my thought. And then the website piece, you know, like I said, I already have a website. I think, I think for any, you know, uh, business, small business owner who wants to be online, it's great to have your to get your own website and not be dependent on any platform. You know, Etsy's Etsy's really great, but you know, if Etsy just vanished, um, mm-hmm. I would still have my website and I could create a new a new shopping cart plugin and I would be fine. Um, so I think that um, I would encourage people to have that sort of create your own. Um, platform and not just depend on any single 
um, you know, outlet, like even for social media, you know, Instagram can go away. Facebook could go away. You know, Facebook has changed many of its, um, the way I I don't use Facebook really. Um, but I know that for people who do advertise on Facebook, they make changes and the algorithm's different. And, you know, I just, I, I feel like I want to not be relying on any single platform to be, um, supporting what I'm doing. So, yeah, yes. so that's kind of how I felt about it. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I never heard or used the word algorithm more, um, <laughs> more in my life than in over the last couple of years. And I remember learning about algorithms in, in, uh, in high school and then in pharmacy school. And even then, I think now I talk more about algorithms (laughs) because of social media and and Mm -hmm. running a business than than when I was actually learning about, you know, life changing algorithms. Yeah, (laughs) I know. Right. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. We use that word a lot these days. We do. Yeah. I'm like, man, that's. (laughs) this is not how I thought I would be using this term, but it's now it just, it, it brings up a very different picture in my mind when I hear the word algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things uh, that I like that you mentioned, which I also advocate is having your own platform, even if it's not getting as much traffic as some, as, as a site like Etsy, at least not in the very beginning is just having your own platform. And one of the things you said was, if Etsy were to go away, then you still have that. And a thought mm-hmm. occurred to me, um, when you create your listings, do you do you keep um, a record of your product descriptions and everything you put in your listing so that if, God forbid, Etsy were to just pack up and shut down one day, you would you still have that information somewhere so you can put that on your own website so the the product description and mm-hmm. measurements and all that yeah you know i don't and i actually i learned on your podcast i uh you interviewed someone who had created um etsy backup i forget what the yeah. name of it was Batsy. b-a-c-k-t-s-y yes, yes. yes. And that is on my to-do. That's on my Trello board somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't yet done that. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, obviously I have all my photos are on my, I use Google Drive to, oh, I do um, I, to organize all of my files. So I'll have all my photos on Google Drive, which is backed up. Yeah. And I do have some snippets of descriptions here and there. In, in a document, um, but I haven't consistently backed up all of my um, descriptions. And yeah. um, I do have all my like cost information that I also have okay. um, in separate documents and for um, wholesale orders as well. Um, oh, and I use Square. So when I'm at the farmer's market, I use oh, Square. Yeah. Um, and so that also has uh, all of my caught my price information um you know if if for some reason i forgot how much something costs i have that there as well it stores that for you yeah Mm -hmm. yeah so square has a um square has a um it's like an item catalog that you set up where you create all of your um uh you put all your products in there and then you put the, the price and you set up, like, do you want to collect tax as well? And things like that. Oh, oh and that's one, one tip I will say. So Etsy has a feature that integrates with square, yes. which is great if you're worried about managing your inventory, but then you're, you're also paying double fees if you do that. So square has a fee and then you're also paying the Etsy transaction fee. So I don't have that integration um, with square just oh, because really? then you're, you're losing like 8.5% of, of every sale. Good so. to know. I yeah. mean, that was actually going to be my follow-up question was what, what were the fees like? So just to clarify, if you use Square, and for anyone who doesn't know, Square is a credit card reader. So if you're out in the field and selling products, um, it allows you to um, 
it gives you the ability to collect payments by credit card or debit card from from customers um and so you can sell in person at craft fairs and vendor markets uh and uh, farmers markets etc and um like liz mentioned you can integrate it with your etsy shop so that you can make sales directly from your shop too through using the square app selling in person to people but what i didn't know and thank you so much for pointing that out is you end up paying both your Etsy yep. transaction fees and the Square transaction fees. And you know, actually, I should double check that that's true, because maybe Square and Etsy have arranged something where the fee, where the Square waived their fee, but um, I don't know. And even if, oh, then how even would they be they, making a profit? Right. And even if they didn't waive their fee, you're paying a higher Etsy fee. Because the square fee is like 3.5% and the Etsy fee is 5%. So even if there was only one fee from Etsy, uh, it would make it would make more financial sense to use your square yeah. standalone um, with the 3.5% fee. Okay. So uh, if Liz or I learn differently when it comes to the fees, I will put an update in the show notes for this episode. So um, if you're listening to this and you just want to verify if this is actually true or not, please go to <laughs> com, and yeah. um, I will correct any misinformation um, if, if it, if that's what it turns out to be. And I will take yeah. the blame. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's my fault. I just assume that, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's possible they have some special arrangement. Yeah. But. Yeah. Liz, what advice would you give to um, that relatively new seller who who is on the platform? You've been on Etsy since 2017. So you I, I feel like you're still kind of in touch with what it felt like to start a new shop and grow a shop and, um, you know, generate sales and whatnot. And you've probably experienced um, some drought periods and not so drought periods. What would you say to that person listening now who is um, kind of in the beginning stages of their Etsy shop and still trying to figure things out? Yeah, I would say um, to think about what your story is and um, what makes your shop unique and special um and i would really try to highlight that um to make your shop um you know stand out and to be really be a reflection of you um so yeah i would say just think about what your story is why you're doing this why it's unique um and and make sure that you can share that with people who come to your shop so um yeah i think that would be my main advice Thank to you. a new person. Yeah. Oh, good. And I know um, I was reading an article recently on Etsy about um, it's their They just came out with their ultimate guide to search, I think is what they called it. And and they emphasized um, your about story, which is basically what you're saying. Well, that was one of the things they emphasized that sellers should do is um work on their story essentially and i don't know how that ties into sales but if etsy says to do it and it's part of their guide to showing up in search then then do it yeah <laughs> now definitely we've talked about different tools that you use do we um we mentioned trello for um managing your blog posts and mailchimp and Baxi and square is there any other tool that um, you might not have already mentioned that you find indispensable in running your business right now? Um, well, my my camera on my phone, it's not a fancy camera, but um, that's really important, being able to take photos and do a quick edit of them and then um, upload them or share it on Instagram. That's been really yeah. helpful. Um, I also use Evernote, which is another free app where, um, it's nice for just jotting notes on your phone on the go. Mm -hmm. 
Um, if you're not, you know, you're not in front of your computer and it's not as convenient for you to open a Google doc. Um, so I have a couple of running notes in there of different ideas that come to me. Um, yeah. So my camera and Evernote, um, is, is there a particular photo editing app that you use to edit your pictures on the phone? I don't know, but that reminds me, I also use Canva which okay. is another, it's another free app and website. I just use the online version, um, you know, I'm using yeah. within Chrome. Um, and that's a great simple way to create Instagram posts. If you want to have a little text on your photo or to create Pinterest pins. Oh, yes. um, and one other resource I use Pixabay. For... I love Pixabay. Yeah. yeah. So free, free photos, um, that you can search and you can reuse, yes. um, you can, you know, edit them to your purposes. So I use Pixabay a lot too. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I like Pixabay and, um, there I'll, I'll link to actually I'll link to everything that Liz has mentioned. So anyone listening who's interested can go and check, check them out. Liz, do you have an Etsy shop shout out? This would be a shop or another seller that you, um, that perhaps someone that has helped you along the way or a shop that you find particularly um, interesting. Perhaps you like shopping there, you like their products or what have you. And if yeah. you don't have them, that's okay. No, I have, I have a couple of shout outs. Oh, so there's, cool. um, so there's a few other Etsy shops, Santa Cruz, uh, Santa Cruz Etsy shop owners. Yeah. And um, one of one of my favorites is um, Herb Apothecary. Um, so she makes wonderful um, skincare products and lip balms um, and masks, um, face masks and face oils. So her stuff is great. Herb apothecary. And the other person, um, is Ev and no, um, she makes really cool jewelry and, um, and leggings and, um, tops. She's a painter and, um, a jewelry designer. And so she has like hand she has painted leggings, not hand painted, but like her paint designs yeah. are, are on the leggings and they're really beautiful. And her jewelry also is really beautiful. So can, yeah, those can two. You spell that? Ed yeah, it's, it's E-V mm-hmm. and N-O. So it's short for everything and nothing. Oh, smart. Okay. Yeah. Ev and no. Yeah. Okay, good. So if anyone wants to hop over there and check them out, you can. I will link also to both of these Etsy shops, Ev and No and Herb Apothecary. So in case you don't remember um, and you're on convome.com, you can go click to their shops and let them know Liz sent you. Yeah. Liz, <laughs> <Totally>. what's, <laughs> what's the best way folks can get in touch with you if someone wants to reach out um, and, and connect with you? Yeah, so I would send folks to my website, notraceshop.com, okay. and you, there's a contact me page on there. Um, so that's the easiest way to reach me. Uh, and you could also follow me on Instagram if you yes. – I'm also on there, like I said, every day. Um, and my Instagram uh, handle is no trace shop, and there's a underscore, so it's no underscore trace underscore shop. Okay. All right. And I will link to Liz's Instagram account as well as her website. Again, that's notraceshop.com. And of course, her Etsy shop too, which is No Trace Shop. There will be links to all of these in the show notes for this episode. So if you're listening in an app, you can actually um, jump right there or go to convome.com. Liz, thank you so much. Thank you, first of all, for the education about what zero waste is, what that means, and how each of us can play a part in just helping uh, to uh, helping the environment by being more conscious of the products we use and how we use them, and doing our own our own part, even if it means starting off 
just a little bit at a time and then expanding on what we can do. Um, I thank you so much for sharing ideas and it, it doesn't seem as overwhelming as one might think if we just take it one step at a time. And and so I'm, I'm glad that you were able to clear that up and, and just make it seem so achievable. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. I, I love to talk about these things that I really care about and um, yeah, and to talk about my business too. So it's been really great. Yes, it's been my pleasure. And I thank you for listening to the podcast. Um, thanks again, Liz, for your time. Um, thank you for what you're doing at No Trace Shop too for the environment as well. I knew there was something I forgot to say. <laughs> and, and also just for sharing your business journey and what you're doing and, and how. And um, I really do appreciate the fact that um, just talking through with you how you're running an eco-friendly business makes it... Um, seem more achievable for people like me who have thought oh, but there's just no way you know it's not sus- yeah. it's not yeah. it's not financially feasible to run an eco-friendly business but um, I think it is now so thanks for Good. making me aware of that <laughs> yeah absolutely and again I thank you for listening to the podcast I will be back next week Thank you for listening. You can subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, and while you're there, please leave a review, too. Visit ConvoMe.com to leave a comment or feedback on this episode. <laughs>